Welcome back. Today we're reacting to a little bit more Kurzgesagt. We're going to be watching the Fermi Paradox Part 2, Solutions and Ideas. Where are all the aliens? Where are they? I don't know. Do you? We're trying something a little bit new today with the format. I kind of think I might like this a little bit better. I was able to fix the resolution on my camera. It's now full glorious 1080p. So rather than making you look at a high def version of this ugly mug, We'll focus on the video and put me in the corner and let me know how you like it. There are probably 10,000 stars for every grain of sand on Earth in the observable universe. What? We know that there might be trillions of planets, so where are all the aliens? Okay, yes, I've heard the trillion of planet thing before. That there's at least a trillion planets. But, when you put it in that perspective to being 10,000 planets per grain of sand on our planet... That's just another mind-blowing way of looking at it, that just, for some reason, when you word it that way, it's even more impressive to me. Because trillion, what's a trillion? We can't visualize that, that's just a number. Although, to be fair, we can't visualize how many grains of sand there are, either. Eh, whatever. This is the Fermi Paradox. It's a lot. If you want to know more about it, watch part one. Here, we look at possible solutions to the Fermi Paradox. Mm -hmm. So, will we be destroyed, or does a glorious future await us? We'll destroy ourselves. Dun, dun, dun. Space travel is hard. Although possible, it's an enormous challenge to travel to other stars. Massive amounts of material have to be put into orbit and assembled. A journey of maybe thousands of years needs to be survived by a population big enough to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And the planet might not be as hospitable as it seemed from afar. It was already extremely hard to set up a spaceship that could survive the trip. An interstellar invasion might be impossible to put off. Also, That's a very, very, very good point. Space travel is very hard. You're telling me that you're going to invest all of those resources into building these ships, getting basically an armada of battleships that can make this journey in the first place, spending the time required to make the journey, not to mention the economic drain that building everything would have on you, and send them, knowing that space travel is also extremely dangerous, so there's a very good chance they never make it to the other end in the first place. It just doesn't seem feasible to me. Granted, we're a young civilization, potentially speaking, compared to others out there. But to me, it just doesn't seem like it would be worth it. There's not going to be an alien invasion, in my opinion. It's just way too just ridiculously out there. Consider time. The universe is very old. On Earth, there's been life for at least 3.6 billion years. Intelligent wow. human life for about 250,000 years. But <laughs> Intelligent human life. Well, you know what? We're getting there. I, I wouldn't say it's been around for that long. We're, we're getting to intelligent human life. I, I don't think we're quite there yet. <laughs> but only for about a century have we had the technology to communicate over great distances. There might have been grand alien empires that stretched across thousands of systems and existed for millions of years, and we might just have missed them. There might be grandiose ruins rotting away on it's distant true. worlds. And we may never know. percent of all species on Earth have died out. It's easy to argue that this will be our fate sooner or later. Intelligent life may develop, spread over a few systems, and die off over and over again. But galactic civilizations might never meet, so maybe it's a unifying experience Mew. for life in the universe to look at the stars and wonder, where is everyone? But there is no reason to assume aliens are like us, or that our logic applies to them. Mm -hmm. It might just be that our means of communication are extremely primitive and out- That's a huge consideration. Our sample size for intelligent life, at least intelligent to the point of ever potentially being able to space travel is one we have one single sample of that and that's us so when it comes to data samples and making assumptions we are making all sorts of assumptions because this is all we have to go by now i also believe that other life would develop in similar conditions to us and they would have similar evolutionary traits to us because at least 
from what we know, once again, making large assumptions, it's required in order to get to the top of the food chain, in order to basically establish yourself as the dominant species of a planet, you have to have certain traits. Otherwise, you'll never make it there. So I think it's a relatively safe assumption as long as we know and acknowledge that we are making major assumptions because we have such a limited data set. Dated. Imagine sitting in a house with a Morse code transmitter. You'd keep sending messages, but nobody would answer, and you'd feel pretty lonely. Maybe we're still undetectable for intelligent species, and will remain so until we learn to communicate properly. And even if we met aliens, we might be too different to be able to communicate okay, with them man. in a meaningful way. Imagine the smartest squirrel you can. No matter how hard you try, you won't be able to explain our society to it. Another thing to consider, too, when we're talking about differences between us and any potential alien lives that is, you know, intelligent, would be we have certain senses. We have sight, you know, our vision. We can hear, we can feel, we can smell, we can taste. We, we have certain senses that we live with every day and take for granted. Now, there's no guarantee that any extraterrestrial life would have these same exact senses or the same interpretation of those senses. However, the counter argument to that is some things like vision has evolved independently in multiple instances. So we have, you know, insects developed eyes separate from mammals. We have uh, reptiles that developed eyes separately from mammals and, and other, I, I believe even in insects, there's various types of eyes that develop separately. And there's all these like different types of eyes. And yes, they interpret light in different ways, but they all interpret light. And that has been such a critical factor for evolution that it's actually emerged more than once actually it's been it's been numerous times independent of each other so there's a high chance i would argue that a lot of our senses would be very similar or you know at least to the point where they're recognizable as doing the same thing but there could also be just new senses that we're not familiar with like how birds can feel the magnets uh what do you call that birds can feel the magnetic field of the planet that we can't identify with that at all. We can visualize the magnetic field and and think in our heads about what that must be like, but we have no idea what that actual experience is like. So instances like that, it could just be apples and oranges, but I think there'll be a little bit more similarity than we give it credit for. After all, from the squirrel's perspective, a tree is all that a sophisticated intelligence like itself needs to survive. So, True. humans cutting down whole forests is madness. But we don't destroy forests because we hate squirrels. We just want the resources. Well, the squirrels we do hate squirrels. The squirrel's survival are of no concern to us. A type 3 civilization in need of resources may treat us in a similar way. They might just evaporate our oceans to make collecting whatever they need easier. One of the aliens might think for a second, oh, tiny little apes, they build really cute concrete structures. Oh, well, now they're dead. Before <laughs> That's actually something that terrifies me if we ever do discover life outside of Earth, is if there is a life that's more advanced than us, and you apply some of the evolutionary traits that we talked about before that are necessary, at least from our vantage point, in order to get to the top of your food chain, in order to establish yourself as the dominant species on a planet, then you find yourself in a situation where to them, we are but insects. We don't consider how we're harming um, the insect population with our agriculture. We don't consider or really care about the squirrel example is a really good one. The squirrels, when we're deforesting places to get our resources that we need, we don't care about that. Some of us do, but as a species, we don't. And if there is more advanced life out there, well, let me rephrase that. If there is any other life out there that we can discover, that means without a shadow of a doubt that there is advanced life out there, more advanced than us, in my mind we become the insects 
And that's scary. For activating warp speed. But if there is a civilization out there that wants to eliminate other species, it's far more likely that it will be motivated by culture rather than by economics. And anyway, it will be more effective to automate the process by constructing the perfect weapon, a self-replicating space probe made from nanomachines. They operate on a molecular level oh, great incredibly goo. fast and deadly, with the power to attack and dismantle anything in an instant. You only need to give them four instructions. One, find a planet with life. Grey Goo is scary. Disassemble everything on this planet into its component parts. I don't think that Grey Goo would be something that's actually feasibly ever going to be put into use because of the ability or likelihood of it going wrong for the species that created it. With that being said, it's quite possible that maybe, you know, humans are dumb, we might do it. <laughs> But I, I just really don't think that that's a likely scenario. A potentially possible one, but not likely. Three, use the resources to build new space probes. Four, repeat. A doomsday machine like this could render a galaxy sterile in a few million years. But why would you fly light years to gather resources or commit genocide? The speed of light is actually not very fast. If someone could travel at the speed of light, it would still take 100,000 years to cross the Milky Way once, and you'll probably travel oh. way slower. There might be way more enjoyable things than destroying civilizations and building empires. An interesting concept is the Video games. a megastructure surrounding a star. A computer of such computing power that an entire species could upload their consciousness and exist in a simulated universe. Potentially, one could experience an eternity <laughs> of pure ecstasies without ever being bored or sad. A perfect life. It, it could be argued, though, at that level of sophistication, that you could have every member of that species experience uh, existence of pure ecstasy in actuality as well, without the simulation part. That just adds another extra step of complexity. Granted, it could be argued, there's a philosophical argument that maybe you could live forever if you're digitized. But, you know, we covered that in a pretty detail in our mind upload video. So I'm not going to rehash that here. But it feels like you could accomplish that without the simulation if you are at that level of an advancement. If built around a red dwarf, this computer could be powered for up to 10 trillion years. Who would want to conquer the galaxy or make contact with other life forms if this were an option? All these solutions to the Fermi paradox have one problem. We don't know where the borders of technology are. Yeah. We could be close to the limit or nowhere near it. And super technology awaits us, granting us immortality, transporting us to other galaxies, elevating us to the level of gods. One thing Technology is scary because at every point in time where we've made technology uh, where we've made technological advancements we think that that's on the border of where we can be now some people know that hey this can be applied in other ways and, and there's potential here and everything but it's within a certain limit it's not breaking the bounds if you know what i mean it's very rare that those types of breakthroughs come through but if you take technology from any era and you were to bring it back to the previous era, era, those beings are basically gods compared to the past beings. The technology that we wield today is completely science fiction 100 years ago. There's no doubt about it. The technology that was wielded 100 years ago is completely science fiction for 200 years ago. Now, we're also at a rate of insane technological advancement right now, the likes of which humanity has never seen before, but this, it still stands, in my opinion. Technology from 100 years in the future will likely be unrecognizable to us today. I think that there is a limit, but I don't think we're anywhere near that limit. Science fiction is just science that hasn't been discovered yet thing we do have to acknowledge is that we really don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Humans have spent more than 90% of their existence as hunter-gatherers. 500 years ago, we thought we were the center of the universe. 200 yeah. years ago, we stopped using human labor as the main source of energy. Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, we had apocalyptic weapons pointed at each other because of political disagreements. We still On do. On the galactic timescale, we are embryos. 
We've come far, but still have a long way to go. The mindset that we really are the center of the universe is still strong in humans, so it's easy to make arrogant assumptions about life in the universe. We're the center of our universe. That part is irrefutable and true, but we're nothing special compared to the rest of the universe. But in the end, there's only one way to find out, right? I love that video. I mean, I, I love the Fermi paradox. I love talking about alien life because I do truly believe that there's life out there. Uh, the stats, the statistics, the chances, the probability, there's no way that life does not exist in some form out there. We may never discover it, but I believe it exists. But the bigger question is really, what are the limits of life? How far can we take this technologically? We live on a brink right now. We're on the verge of destroying ourselves every day with nuclear war. We are harming our only home that we have at the moment without really trying with much effort to grow the number of homes that we have with climate change. We also are building technology and a society that relies on this technology that's extremely susceptible to natural events like solar flares and stuff like that. And we could be set back hundreds of years in certain scenarios that we cannot prevent. And we could take measures to prevent that from happening. And we are a little bit. Our power grid is consistently getting updated, but it's still surprisingly behind. But it, we're very young and immature in my mind as a species. We're sort of like the rebellious teenager stage, right? We, we got everything we need. You know, we just turned 18. We can make our own decisions now. We can drive, we can go live on our own and get a little adventurous, but you know what? Screw, screw all the adults. We know, we know what we're doing. We know everything. We don't need to listen to them and their reason. What do they know? I kind of feel like that's the stage that we're at right now as a planet. And we still have to learn from our own mistakes. And hopefully those mistakes are, you know, not bad enough that we can continue to grow and learn. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Go check out my gaming channel if you haven't. It's linked on the channel page. We play some pretty cool games over there. And uh, I hope you have a very wonderful day. Thank you.